purpose ever was. Hmm. Nobody ever helps me into carriages or over mud puddles or gives me any best place. And ain't not a woman. Look at my mama. I have plowed and planted and gathered into barns and no man could head me. And ain't I a woman. I could work as much and eat as much as a man when I could get it and bear the lash as well. And ain't I a woman? I have borne 13 children and seen the most all sold off to slavery. And when I cried out with my mother's grief, none but Jesus heard me. And ain't I a woman? Then, then they talks about this thing in the head, uh, what does they call it? Uh, intellect, yeah, that's it, honey. What? Have to do with women's rights or niggas' rights. If my cup won't hold but a pint and yours hold a quart, wouldn't you be mean not to let me have my little half measure? Then that little man in the black there, he say, women can't have as much rights as men because Christ wants a woman. <laughs> Where did your Christ come from? Where did your Christ come from? From God and a woman. Man had nothing to do with him. If the first woman God ever made was strong enough to turn the world upside down all alone, these women together ought to be able to turn it back and get it right side up again. And now they is asking to do it. The men better let them. That was fantastic. <laughs> hey, that was great. That was so wonderful. Thank you so mm -hmm. much, Aisha. So now we're going to be segueing into the work of Frederick Douglass, um, his famous speech, What to the Slave is the 4th of July. Frederick Douglass was born in 1818. He died in 1895. He was one of the most influential African-American leaders of the 19th century. After escaping from slavery in 1838, Douglas worked as an agent for the Massachusetts Anti-Slavery Society. And he was so eloquent as a public speaker that many whites doubted that he had ever been a slave. And this is where many times well, people will say, no, he wasn't a slave. Well, he was a slave for a very short time and escaped um, somewhere in his early 20s. Partially to silence his critics, Douglas authored to prove his worth to himself and to those around him, the narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass in 1845. And it was after this publication, his autobiography, that he was forced to leave the United States and he lived for two years in the UK. And in 1847, he returned to the United States and established the North Star newspaper, and which was later named the Frederick Douglass newspaper. He was a prominent abolitionist. He set the tone for many white abolitionists and educated them. And he was extensively involved in many other reform movements, specifically women's suffrage, the right to vote. After the Civil War, Douglass became a central figure in the National Republican Party, which many refer to later as the Party of Black People, uh, Party of Lincoln, introducing Robert Trey Coppage, reading an abridged version of What to the Slave is the 4th of July. Fellow citizens, pardon me and allow me to ask, why am I called upon to speak here today? What have I or those I represent to do with your national independence? Are the great principles of political freedom and of natural justice embodied in that Declaration of Independence extended to us? And am I therefore called upon to bring our humble offering to the national altar and to confess the benefits and express devout gratitude for the blessings resulting from your independence to us? Would to God both for your sakes and ours that an affirmative answer could be truthfully returned to those questions? Then would my task be light and my burden be easy and delightful? For who is there so cold that a nation's sympathy could not warm him? Why so arbitrary and dead to the claims of gratitude that would not thankfully acknowledge such priceless benefits? Who so stolid and selfish 
that would not give his voice to swell the hallelujahs of a nation's jubilee when the chains of servitude had been torn from his limbs. I am not that man. In a case like that, the dumb might eloquently speak and the lame man leap like a hare, but such is not the state of the case. I say it with a sad sense of disparity between us. I am not included within the pale of this glorious anniversary. Your high independence only reveals the immeasurable distance between us. The blessings in which you this day rejoice are not enjoyed in common. The rich inheritance of justice, liberty, prosperity, and independence bequeathed by your fathers is shared by you, not by me. The sunlight that brought life and healing to you has brought stripes and death to me. This 4th of July is yours, not mine. You may rejoice, I must mourn. To drag a man in fetters, into the grand illuminated temple of liberty and call upon him to join you in joyous anthems were inhuman mockery and sacrilegious irony. Do you mean citizens to mock me by asking me to speak today? If so, there is a parallel to your conduct and let me warn you that it is a dangerous to copy the example of a nation whose crimes towering up to the heaven were thrown down by the breath of the Almighty, burying the nation in an irrevocable ruin. I can today take up the lament of appealed and woe smitten people. For the present, it is enough to affirm the equal manhood of the Negro race. Is it not astonishing that while we are plowing, planting, and reaping, using all kinds of mechanical tools, erecting houses, constructing bridges, building ships, working in metals of brass, iron, copper, silver, and gold, that while we are reading, writing, ciphering, acting as clerks, merchants, and secretaries, having among us lawyers, doctors, ministers, poets, authors, editors, orators, and teachers, that while we are engaged in all the enterprises common to other men, digging gold in California, capturing the whale in the Pacific, feeding sheep and cattle on the hillside, living, loving, acting, thinking, planning, living in families as husbands, wives, and children, and above all, confessing and worshiping the Christian God and looking hopefully for life and immortality beyond the grave. We are called upon to prove that we are men. Would you have me argue that man is entitled to liberty? That he is the rightful owner of his own body. You have already declared it. Must I argue the wrongfulness of slavery? Is that a question for Republicans? Is it to be settled by the rules of logic and argumentation as a matter of beset with great difficulty involving a doubtful application of the principle of justice? Hard to understand? How should I look today in the presence of Americans? dividing and subdividing a discourse to show that men have natural right to freedom, speaking of it relatively and positively, negatively and affirmatively. To do so would be to make myself ridiculous and to offer an insult to your understanding. There is not a man beneath the canopy of heaven who does not know that slavery is wrong for him. What to the American slave is your 4th of July? I answer, a day that reveals to him more than all other days of the year, the gross injustice and cruelty to which he is the constant victim. To him, your celebration is a sham. Your boasted liberty and unholy license, your national greatness, swelling vanity, your sounds of rejoicing are empty and heartless. Your denunciation of tyrants, brass-fronted impudence, your shouts of liberty and equality, hollow mockery. Your prayers and hymns, your sermons and thanksgivings, with all your religious parade and solemnity, are to him mere bombast, fraud, deception, impiety, and hypocrisy. A thin veil to cover up crimes which would disgrace a nation of savages. There is not a nation of the earth guilty of practices more shocking and bloody than are the people of these United States at this very hour. Thank you, Thank you so much, Trey. That was great.
We will see you, see you back in video soon, we hope. <laughs> um, <laughs> let's see. So uh, we're going to segue to Mel, who's yep. going to walk us into the work of Fannie Lou Hamer. Yes. So uh, born Fannie Lou Townsend, who lived from 1917 to 1977, Hamer was the youngest of 20 children in a family of sharecroppers, and she left school in the sixth grade in order to work full time on a Mississippi plantation. She toiled for most of her life in rural poverty and became involved in civil rights activism when she began working with the SNCC organization in 1962. As a SNCC organizer in Sunflower County, Mississippi, she assisted local black residents in registering to vote. Hamer became vice chair of the insurgent Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party in 1964 and campaigned for Congress from Mississippi's second uh, con excuse me, congressional district. As a leader of the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, Hamer participated in a widely publicized challenge to all the white Mississippi delegation uh, at a 1964 National Democratic Convention in Atlantic City, New Jersey. In a moving public presentation, Hamer testified before the convention's credentials committee about how she had been severely beaten when she and other civil rights activists attempted to challenge Jim Crow laws in Winona, Mississippi. Hamer subsequently established the Freedom Farm Cooperative and was instrumental in building a low-income daycare center and 200 units of low-income housing for her Mississippi community. Hamer consistently fought for women's rights, economic justice, and Black empowerment, and her deep influence among a generation of Black activists cannot be overemphasized. Introducing Ms. Charmaine Merriweather, reading the words of Fannie Lou Hamer. The special plight in the role of Black women is not something that just happened three years ago. We've had a special plight for 350 years. My grandmother had it. My grandmother was a slave. She died in 1960. She was 136 years old. She died in Mount Bayou, Mississippi. It's been a special plight for the Black woman. I remember my uncles and some of my aunts, and that's why it really tickled me when you talked about integration, because I'm very Black. But I remember some of my uncles and some of my aunts was as white as anybody in here and blue-eyed and some kind of green-eyed. And my grandfather didn't do it, you know. So what the folks is fighting at this point is what they started. They started unloading the slave ships to Africa. That's what they started. And right now, sometimes, you know, I work for the liberation of all people because when I liberate myself, I'm liberating other people. But, you know, sometimes I really feel more sorrier for the white woman than I feel for ourselves because she's been caught up in this thing, caught up feeling very special. And folks, I'm gonna put it on the line because my job is not to make people feel comfortable. You've been caught up in this thing because you know, you worked my grandma. And after that, you worked my mother. And then finally you got hold of me and you really thought people, you might try and cool it now, but I've been watching you, baby. You thought that you was more because you was a woman, and especially a white woman. You had this kind of angel feeling that you were untouchable. You know that? There's nothing under the sun that made you believe that you were like me. That under this white pigment of skin is red blood, just like under the black skin of mine. So we was used as black women over and over and over, you know? I remember a time when I was working around white people's house. And one thing that would make me mad as hell, after I would be done slaved all day long, this white woman would get up on the phone, calling some of her friends and said, you know, I'm tired because we have been working. And I said, that's a damn lie. You're not used to that kind of language, honey, but I'm going to tell you where it's at. So all of these things was happening because you had more. You had been put on a pedestal. And then not only put on a pedestal, but you had been put in something like an ivory castle. So what happened to you 
we have busted the castle open and whacking like hell for the pedestal. And when you hit the ground, you're going to have to fight like hell like we've been fighting all this time. In the past, I don't care how poor this white woman was, in the South, she still felt like she was more than us. In the North, I don't care how poor or how rich this white woman has been, she still felt like she was more than us. But coming to this realization of the thing, her freedom is shackled and chained to mine. And she realizes for the first time that she is not free until I am free. The point about it, the male influence in this country, you know, the white male, he didn't go and brainwash the black man and the black woman. He brainwashed his wife, too. He made her think mm -hmm. that she was an angel. You know, the reason I can say it, folks, I've been watching. And there's a lot of people been watching. That's why it's such a shock. Whenever we go throughout this country, it's a great blow. White Americans today don't know what, because when they put us behind them, that's where they made their mistakes. If they had put us in front, they wouldn't have let us look back. But they got us behind them. And we watched every move they made. And this is the reason I tell the world as I travel to and fro, I'm not fighting for equal rights. What do I want to be equal to Senator Eastland for? Just tell me that. But we are not to liberate ourselves. I think it's the responsibility. I think we're special people. God's children is going to help in the survival of this country if it's not too late. We're a lot sicker than people realize we are. Um, what we are doing now in the South, in politics, is gaining seats for Black people and concerned whites in the state of Mississippi. It's going to have an effect on what happens throughout the country. You know, I used to think that if I could go North and tell people about the plight of Black folk in the state of Mississippi, everything would be all right. But traveling around, I found one thing for sure. It's up south and it's down south, and it's no different. The man shoot me in the face in Mississippi, and you turn around, he'll shoot you in the back in New York. We have a problem, folks, and we want to try to deal with the problem. And the only way we can deal with the problem as far as black women, and you know, I'm not hung up on this thing about liberating myself from the black man, I'm not gonna try that thing. I got a black husband, six foot three, 240 pounds with a 14 shoe that I don't want to be liberated from. But we are here to work side by side with this black man and trying to bring liberation to all people. A couple of weeks ago, we moved the first poor white family into Freedom Farm in the history of the state of Mississippi. A white man came to me and said, I got five children and I don't have nowhere to live. I don't have food, I don't have anything. And my children, some of them are sick. And we gave this man a house. We have a job as black women to support whatever is right and to bring injustice where we've had so much injustice. Some people say, well, I work for $24 per week. That's not true in my case. I work sometimes for $15 per week. I remember my mama working for 25 and 30 cents per day. But we are organizing ourselves now because we don't have any other choice. A few years throughout the country, the middle class black woman, I used to say, not really black woman, but the middle class colored woman, C-U-L-L-U-D, didn't even respect the kind of work I was doing. But you see now, baby, whether you have a PhD, a DD, or no D, we're in this bag together. And whether you're from Mississippi, from Morehouse, or no house, we're still in this bag together. Not to fight to try to liberate ourselves from the men. This is another trick to get us fighting among ourselves. But to work together with the Black man, then we will have a better chance to just act as human beings and not be treated 
as human beings in our sick society. I would like to tell you in closing a story of an old man. This old man was very wise and he could answer questions that was almost impossible for people to answer. So some people went to him one day, two young people and said, we're gonna trick this guy today. We're gonna catch a bird. We're gonna carry it to this old man and we're gonna ask him, this that we hold in our hands today, is it alive or is it dead? If he says dead, we're going to turn it loose and let it fly. But if he says alive, we're going to crush it. So they walked up to this old man and they said, this that we hold in our hands today, is it alive or is it dead? He looked at the young people and he smiled and he said, it's in your hands. Thank you, Charmaine. Thank you so much for that. It was very powerful. Fannie Lou Hamer is very powerful. Um, so we're segueing to John Lewis, yes? Yes, we are. Uh, we get a chance to honor one of our beloved leaders that we just lost this year. John R. Lewis, uh, who lived from 1940 to 2020, was born in poverty in Troy, Alabama, and received a bachelor's degree from Fisk University in 1963. As a student in Nashville, Lewis firmly believed in nonviolent social protest, and he was involved in a wide array of sit-ins, freedom rides, and marches. He also served as chairman of SNCC from 1963 to 1966. In 1963, Lewis gave an address at the March on Washington that stirred controversy when some of the march organizers insisted that aspects of his speech uh, that forcefully criticized the Kennedy administration be deleted at the last minute. Uh, and what you're going to hear uh, represents the original text. In the 1970s, Lewis launched an original political career in Atlanta. In 1986, he upset the highly favored candidacy of Julian Bond to become a Democratic congressman from Georgia in the US, US House of Representatives. In 1991, Lewis was appointed as one of the three chief de deputy whips in the House, thereby becoming one of the most influential politicians in Congress. Lewis passed away after dedicating his life to civil rights activism on July 17th of this year. And so introducing our very own founder and executive director, Mr. Harvey Williams, reading The Revolution is at Hand by John R. Lewis. We march today for jobs and freedom, but we have nothing to be proud of. For hundreds and thousands of our brothers are not here, but they have no money for the transportation. For they are receiving starvation wages or no wages at all. In good conscience, we cannot support the administration's civil rights bill, for it is too little and too late. There is not one thing in the bill that will protect our people from police brutality. The voting section of this bill will not help the thousands of citizens who want to vote, will not help the citizens of, of Mississippi or Alabama and Georgia who are qualified to vote, who are without a sixth grade education. One man, one vote is the African cry. It is ours too. People have been forced to move for they have exercised their right registered to vote. What is in the bill that will protect the homeless and the starving people of this nation? What is there in this bill to ensure the equality of a maid who earns $5 a week in the home of a family whose income is $100,000 a year? This bill will not protect young children and old women from police dogs and fire hoses for engaging in peaceful demonstrations. This bill will not protect the citizens in Danville, Virginia, who must live in constant fear in a police state. This bill will not protect the hundreds of people who have been arrested on trumped up charges, like those in America's Georgia, where four young men are in jail facing a death penalty for engaging in peaceful protest. 
for the first time in a hundred years, this nation is being awakened to the fact that segregation is evil and it must be destroyed in all forms. Our presence today proved that we have been aroused to the point of action. We are now involved in a serious revolution. This nation is still a place of political leaders aligning themselves with open forms of political, economic, and social exploitation. In some parts of the South, we have worked in the field from sunup to sundown for $12 a week. In Albany, Georgia, we have seen our people indicted by the federal government for peaceful protest, while the deputy sheriff beat attorney C.B. King and left him half dead, while local police officials kicked and assaulted the pregnant wife of Slater King, and she lost her baby. It seems to me the Albany indictment is a part of a conspiracy on the part of the federal government and local politicians for political expediency. I want to know, which side is the federal government on? The revolution is at hand, and we must free ourselves of the change of political and economic slavery. The nonviolent revolution is saying, we will not wait for the courts to act, for we have been waiting hundreds of years. We will not wait for the president, nor the Justice Department, nor Congress, but we will take matters into our own hands and create a great source of power outside of any national structure that could and would assure us victory. For those who have said, be patient and wait, we must say, patience is a dirty and nasty word. We cannot be patient. We do not want to be free gradually. We want our freedom and we want it now. We cannot depend on any political party, for both the Democrats and the Republicans have betrayed the basic principles of the Declaration of Independence. We all recognize the fact that any radical social, political, and economic changes are to take place in our society, the people, the masses must bring them about. In the struggle, we must seek more than mere civil rights. We must work for the community of love, peace, and true brotherhood. Our minds, souls, and hearts cannot rest until freedom and justice exist for all the people. The revolution is a serious one. Mr. Kennedy is trying to take the revolution out of the streets and put it in the courts. Listen, Mr. Kennedy, listen, Mr. Congressman, listen, fellow citizens. The black masses are on the march for jobs and freedom. And we must say to the politicians, that there won't be a cooling off period. We won't stop now. And all the forces of Eastland, Barnett, and Wallace won't stop this revolution. The next time we march, we won't march on Washington, but we will march through the South, through the heart of Dixie. The way Sherman did, we will make the action of the past few months look petty. And I say to you, wake up America. All of us must get in the revolution. Get in and stay in the streets of every city, village, and hamlet of this nation until true freedom comes, until the revolution is complete. The black masses in the Delta of Mississippi, in Southwest Georgia, Alabama, Harlem, Chicago, Philadelphia, and all over this nation are on the march. Thank you so much, Harvey, for those very powerful words, which sadly um, seem as if they were written just today um, in this moment. Um, the next uh, reading we'll have is from the work of Malcolm X. It is 
from a speech that he gave called The Ballot or the Bullet. Um, Malcolm X was born Malcolm Little uh, in 1925. Um, he died tragically uh, through assassination in 1965. He grew up in Michigan under difficult circumstances after his father was murdered by racists. He then worked as a small time hustler and drug dealer in Boston and Harlem. Um, many of us know this period as his uh, Detroit Red period until he was arrested for robbery in 1946. Malcolm converted to the Nation of Islam, otherwise known as NOI in 1948. Following his release, from prison, he quickly established his reputation as a brilliant, fiery tongued orator, and through his tenure as an NOI minister in Harlem, the organization enjoyed a marked increase in its membership. By 1962, however, Elijah Muhammad and other prominent Nation of Islam leaders had become privately critical of Malcolm, many say jealous of his growing national prominence outside their organization. After a controversial remark made by Malcolm following the assassination of President John F. Kennedy, Muhammad seized the opportunity to, quote, silence, end quote, his protege. Malcolm left the Nation of Islam in March 1964, establishing the Religious Muslim Mosque Incorporated. And several months later, the Organization of Afro-American Unity. And if you've never read the platform of the Organization of Afro-American Unity, it's available online, I suggest you read it. In his last year of life, Malcolm made a well-publicized pilgrimage to Mecca and traveled extensively throughout Africa. Politically and ideologically, he was rapidly changing and embracing a revolutionary black nationalist internationalist perspective, which led to his extensive surveillance by the FBI. And, and that in layman's terms is a transnational connection, not only between black people around the world, but looking at people of color transnationally who had a shared plight of black people uh, around the world. On February 21st, 1965, Malcolm was assassinated in the Audubon Ballroom in Harlem. Um, there's a trigger note for audience members. Um, there are some um, racial pejorative terms that may be used in the speech. Um, and so we wanted to give you a warning of those and we are happy to address them later um, in our talk back with you. Uh, so without further ado, I give you Lewis Morrow reading an abridged version of Malcolm X's famous speech, The Ballot or the Bullet. Mr. Moderator, brothers and sisters, friends and enemies, I just can't believe everyone in here is a friend and I don't want to leave anybody out. The question tonight, as I understand it, is the Negro revolt and where do we go from here or what next? In my little humble way of understanding it, it points to either the bullet or the ballot. And before we try to explain what is meant by the ballot or the bullet, I would like to clarify something concerning myself. I'm still a Muslim. My religion is still Islam. That's my personal belief. Just as Adam Clayton Powell is a Christian minister who heads the Abyssinian Baptist Church in New York, but at the same time takes part in political struggles to try and bring about rights to the black people in this country. And Dr. Martin Luther King is a Christian minister down in Atlanta, Georgia, who heads another organization fighting for the civil rights of black people in this country. And Reverend Glamison, I guess you've heard of him, is another Christian minister in New York who has been deeply involved in the school boycotts to eliminate segregated education. Well, I myself am a minister, not a Christian minister, but a Muslim minister. And I believe action on all fronts by whatever means necessary. Now, although I still am a Muslim, I'm not here tonight to discuss my religion. I'm not here to try and change your religion. I'm not here to argue or discuss anything that we differ about because it's time for us to submerge our differences and realize that it is best for us to first see what we have the same problem, a common problem, a problem that will make you catch hell whether you're a Baptist or a Methodist or a Muslim or a nationalist, whether you're educated or literate, whether you live on the boulevard or in the alley, you're gonna catch hell just like I am. We're all in the same boat and we all are going to catch the same hell from the same man. He just happens to be a white man. All of us have suffered here in this country, political oppression at the hands of the white man, economic exploitation at the hands of the white man and social degradation at the hands of the white man. Now in speaking like this, it doesn't mean that we're anti-white, but it does mean we're anti-exploitation. We're anti-degradation, we're anti-oppression. And if the white man doesn't want us to be anti him, let them stop oppressing and exploiting and degrading us. 
whether we are Christians or Muslims or nationalists or agnostics or atheists, we must first learn to forget our differences. If we have differences, let us differ in the closet. When we come out in front, let us not have anything to argue about until we get finished arguing with the man. If the late President Kennedy could get together with Khrushchev and exchange some wheat, we certainly have more in common with each other than Kennedy and Khrushchev had with each other. If we don't do something real soon, I think you'll have to agree that we're going to be forced to either use the ballot or the bullet. It's one or the other in 1964. It isn't that time is running out. Time has run out. 1964 threatens to be the most explosive year America has witnessed, the most explosive year. You know why? It's also a political year. It's the year where all the white politicians will be back in the so-called Negro community, jiving you and me for some votes. Well, I'm one who doesn't believe in deluding myself. I'm not going to sit at the table and watch you eat with nothing on my plate and call myself a diner. Sitting at the table does not make you a diner unless you eat some of what's on that plate. Being here in America doesn't make you an American. Being born here in America doesn't make you an American. Why, if birth made you an American, you wouldn't need legislation. You wouldn't need any amendments to the Constitution. You wouldn't be faced with civil rights filibustering in Washington, D.C. right now. So it's time in 1964 to wake up. And when you see them coming with that kind of conspiracy, let them know your eyes are open. And let them know you got something else that's wide open too. It's got to be the ballot or the bullet. The ballot or the bullet. If you're afraid to use an expression like that, you should get on out the country. You should get back to the cotton patch. You should get back in the alley. So where do we go from here? Now first we need some friends. We need some new allies. The entire civil rights struggle needs a new interpretation, a broader interpretation. We need to look at this civil rights thing from another angle, from the inside as well as from the outside. To those of us whose philosophy is black nationalism, the only way you can get involved in the civil rights struggle is to give it a new interpretation. The old interpretation excluded us. It kept us out. So we were given a new interpretation of the civil rights struggle, an interpretation that will enable us to come into it, take part in it. And these handkerchief heads who have been dilly-dallying and pussyfooting and compromising, we don't intend to let them pussyfoot and dilly-dally and compromise any longer. How can you thank a man for, for giving you what's already yours? How then can you thank him for giving you only part of what's already yours? You haven't even made progress if that's what's been given to you. You should have already had that. That's not progress. And I love my brother Lomax, the way he pointed out, we're right back where we were in 1954. We're not even as far as we were in 1954. We're behind where we were in 1954. That's more segregation now than there was in 1954. There's more racial animosity, more racial hatred, more racial violence today in 1964 than there was in 1954. Where's the progress? The social philosophy of black nationalism only means that we have to get together and remove the evils, the vices, alcoholism, drug addiction, and other evils that are destroying the moral fiber of our community. We ourselves have to lift the level of our community, the standard of our community to a higher level, make our own society beautiful so that we will all be satisfied in our own social circles. And won't be running around here trying to knock our way into a social circle where we're not wanted. So I say in spreading a gospel such as black nationalism, it is not designed to make the man, black man, reevaluate the white man. You know him already. But to make the black man reevaluate himself. Don't change the white man's mind. You can't change his mind. And that whole thing about appealing to the moral conscience of America, America's conscience is bankrupt. She lost all conscience a long time ago. Uncle Sam has no conscience. They don't know what morals are. They don't try and eliminate an evil because it's evil or because it's illegal or because it's immoral. They eliminate it only when and if it threatens their own existence. So you're waiting your time, uh, wasting your time, appealing to the moral conscience of a bankrupt man like Uncle Sam. If he had a conscience, he'd straighten this thing out with no more pressure being put on. So it's not necessary to change the white man's mind. We have to change our own mind. You can't change his mind about us. We've got to change our own minds about each other. And we will work with anybody anywhere, at any time, who is genuinely interested in tackling the problem head on, non-violently, as long as the enemy is non-violent, but violent when the enemy gets violent. The black nationalists aren't going to wait. Lyndon B. Johnson is the head of the Democratic Party. If he's for civil rights, let him go into the Senate next week and declare himself. Let him go in there right now and declare himself. Let him denounce the Southern branch of his party. Let him go in there right now and take a moral stand right now, not later. 
tell them, don't want to wait for election time. If he waits too long, brothers and sisters, he will be responsible for letting a condition develop in this country, which will create a climate, climate that will bring seeds up out of the ground with vegetation on the end of them looking like something these people never dreamed of. In 1964, it's the ballot or the bullet. Wow. Thank you so much. So uh, we're all cameras on. We have a few minutes. We understand that you've taken precious time out of your schedule to be with us tonight. So we'd like to be able to open it up to um, the audience uh, for questions. And uh, we just felt that these were really important words in our American history that we should play back to our community so that we can encourage you um, as you go out right now to uh, cast your vote and to encourage others to vote. Mm -hmm. Uh, it, it is a, a civil right that we fought desperately for. So um, I think, Linda, we're looking at the chat. Uh, if anyone has any questions for any of the performers or any of us generally about what's going on um, right now, we, we invite those and thank you guys so much for being with us. And we invite the participants if you want to share your I'll video now. A video on if you like, yes. I have a question. Please. Can anyone hear me? First of all, this is Sherry Let Mosley. Can you hear or see me? Yes. Oh. You can see, okay, because I can't see everyone. I can see only one person at a time, so I think I've done something wrong, but I did hear all the participants, and I just want to say that it was very um, jarring, to be truthful, that every single one that I've heard can be actually so true today. You can just take out the year and it will be just as much truth in it today as it was back then. And that in itself is inspiring about why we have to go vote. We cannot allow any gangs. We can't go in there putting in any names. We have to say one or the other and discuss things later on after we get the first person out of office. And that's what I get from it right there. We know that uh, Democrats and the Republicans sometimes really don't have our best interests in mind. But right now, what's the most important, in my opinion, is that we have to, under no uncertainty, um, get the one person out of office and also change the Congress and the Senate so we can have things go in our direction. Thank you so much, Sherry. I think it's important to know that uh, you know, John Lewis was, you know, organizing when he was in college. Um, Fannie Lou Hammer was organizing, you know, as a just everyday working citizen. I think it doesn't take anyone to be, quote unquote, exceptional to get involved in your community. What's exceptional is us just making a step to be involved. And uh, that can be involved in any way that you feel comfortable. So, um, Thanks so much for drawing our attention to that. Great. Thank you, Jerry. Oh, I'd like to say something. So, um, well, I grew up in the school. My parents sent me to a private all-Black school, so a lot of these speeches were a part of our education. Um, but honestly, the last time I read a lot of these things, I was probably in like third or fourth grade, and I haven't thought about it since then. There were speeches I memorized, and you know, it's like history. And for me, like I didn't have the life experience to be able to put in perspective, like what was really going on and what the words really meant. And just taking the time to read through it for a bit and to um, like hear everybody say these speeches. I don't know, it just gave me a deeper understanding of everything, I feel like, because um, it was just, it was just facts and figures that you memorized, <laughs> you know, um, I hadn't really put them in perspective at all. That's great. Where did you go to school? So I'm actually from Arkansas. So I went to this school called um, FCCF. Um, I don't think it even exists anymore. But um, yeah, <laughs> sounds was, like a school. Uh, sounds like my kind of school. <laughs> yeah, it was private and it was all black teachers, all black students, and they made they drilled black history into us. So. <laughs> 
Like that, that's what we did all day long. Mm-hmm. Well, that's great. I mean, one point is well taken though, that it's all facts and figures without a, a, um, a, a context that is valuable to you to, to put it in, no matter how we get the history. But I think the fact that this history is repressed in all of our mainstream education right now, that students may not discover any of these voices until they reach college um, and not have exposure to them at all, as p- this is part of American history. And uh, the fact that we have still segregated history classes, that this is not included as part of the, na- the narrative is, um, I mean, this is part of what systemic racism is about. Why, why, don't, why don't we all know about these folks? Um, mm-hmm. why, why are we not reading it? Well, and Nicole, and- the, the other thing too that I think adds value is being able to hear the performances audibly mm-hmm. because I think is a part of all of our, probably uh, most of our elementary and middle school and high school curriculum. We had to read certain excerpts of the speeches, but just being able to hear them, I think for me at least, just kind of activates a sense of, of urgency to make sure that um, that we are not being wasteful with this these rights that that have been fought for and people have died for. So um, I think that adds a lot of value too. The performers did a great job. Oh, great, fantastic. Can I can I say something? Okay, thank you. Uh, I, I would just like to say now I, I'm kind of the other end of the spe- uh, spectrum uh, for the younger people because people like John Lewis. I grew up during that period. I mean, so I have strong recollections of the things we went through. And when I heard, uh, I guess a few weeks ago, people, uh, Barack Obama saying that uh, we're in danger of losing, it, 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 there's a fear in me because I've been through, we kind of come full circle. All these things they fought for, and here we are, you know, uh, years and years and years and years later, trying to claw back to square one. And it's very terrifying, I think, for older people, not so much for them, because they've, they've lived most of their life, but for their children and their grandchildren. That, that's what, to me, democracy needs to be saved for. And that's why I hope people will go out and exercise their right to for what these people lived and died for, you know? Yeah, you heard that echo in Malcolm's speech uh, with Lewis Hit, hit those numbers so beautifully. We have less than we had in 1954. And as you remember, 1954 is Brown versus Board, Board of Education, which is you know the first landmark case for desegregation. So the fact in 1964, moments before the Civil Rights Act, he's saying we're, we've made no progress. Like this is piecemeal progress. And, um, I think that we're at a crossroads right now. We're we're revisiting just basic fundamental civil rights that have been fought for that are are now being under threat. Um, I never thought I would say things like, I don't think I would see this in my lifetime, but (laughs) I've I've seen this in my lifetime. You you know, I was really taken by uh, the Malcolm X piece that uh, that Lewis read because I feel like you could take any young black man today and he could do that speech. And they are really, I mean, not in exactly those words, but that's what a lot of the young black folks are saying right now. It's we either make this turn or it's not going to be good. Yeah, it's very powerful. So. Um, it, it's great to see new activists being birthed out of this moment. But I think people think that the only form of activism is, you know, walk, you know, protesting in the streets. But I mean, this type of activism of what we're doing right now of using performance to get the message out to people has also been part of our journey since abolition. You know, William Wells Brown did a one man show, an abolitionist show where he was performing all the different parts to white abolitionists to convince them that they should surrender um, and, and join the abolitionist movement. So, I mean, we've been using performance to get to folks for a long time. 
And there's all type of ways that we can be involved in activism. But the fact that Malcolm X's words are so salient right now are, it's just, it's eerie. Like listening to Lewis read them, I was like, why, why shouldn't this sound archaic? It sounds like he just wrote this. Well, you know, sadly, it sounds like Lewis's work. <laughs> sounds a lot like Lewis's work. So any other questions from folks? Comments, questions? Hi, this is friends. Hey, Leticia. So I just, um, I first of all, I just want to say that um, as I was listening to everyone's performance, it really is almost kind of hurtful um, how much has not changed and how much has not changed for the African-American community and for the new immigrant community and the struggles that we continue to face. And it's disheartening in a lot of ways, but at the same time, I feel that our vote will make a difference. And if this is gonna encourage folks and to, to become much more aware and to get out and vote, we need to continue to tell these stories and to share these speeches and to educate. And one of the main messages I heard um, earlier this week that I wanna share is that a lot of these efforts, a lot of this work is not new for many of us. It's not new. There's new people coming to an awareness. Mm -hmm. of Right. And so I feel that the work that KCMPT does is so important and it needs to be amplified so much more. So I applaud you all for your continued efforts, um, but it needs to be heard on a larger platform. And, and I agree too. just um, the words of Malcolm X. I, I just kept saying, where are we now? has much changed and it it's disheartening to, to say that it doesn't feel like a lot has. Yeah. That's just my personal opinion. And I, I just feel that your work is so important and it needs to be amplified on such a larger scale. Thank, Thank you so much. All. Thank you for being on the board, Leticia. And I mean, I think the more that we can share, I mean, this is a small audience today, but this is also, you know, our first event in this, but um, you know, we, we just need, um, a bigger microphone and I think it's coming little by little, but, um, I agree that we need to have a larger audience. And I think this is a program in the next few weeks that, um, we could easily replicate again. Cause I think it's very powerful. Let me think this is a very powerful program. Yes, so, beautiful. Glad you guys. so glad you're here. Spread the word. We're coming back and we're coming back stronger and we're coming back, um, you know, with initiatives to be safe and to reduce our theater size. We're going to be sending out videos that share with the audience how we're going to come back. And um, we just hope that folks are here. We'll spread the word about what we are doing um, moving forward. We did announce the new season, um, which is State of the Union, how fitting. And um, we, all of the plays uh, will be kind of investigating those questions. Where are we now? Which Leticia was just sharing. So I think we have time for another question. We promised you that the series would not take up a bunch of your time. So um, I just want to make sure that we're true to that promise. Any other questions or comments? I just want to say thank you. That's all. Thank you all. I just want to share with everyone that we have uh, the next series will be uh, coming up on November 16th, same time, 7 to 8 p.m. And we will have Dr. Nzinga Burton. She's the founder of the Burton Wire, which is a black new media platform similar to Huffington Post that centers the work, uh, politics, culture of um, Africans in the diaspora. And she's a professor of film at Emory University. And um, we're going to be thinking about where the nation is after the election. So we'll just be, you know, uh, two weeks out from having a new president or the same president. Um, we don't know. 
Um, but I will say use, use your phones, use your Twitter, use your IG. We took it for granted before folks. We sure did that. We had a shoe in situation and it went real left when you woke up that morning, at least for me. So, um, I would say that the ballot or the bullet said, um, Malcolm and the fact that we have, you know, militia nationally that are organizing on both sides of the election um, takes us back to civil war discourse, you know, of, of where we've been and um, it's real. And that is going to be moderated by Melanie. And I will stop by, I'm sure Harvey, the, the KCMPT leadership folks who can make it will be there. But I think it's going to be great because I think it's important for you to know where are the news outlets that are centered on uh, people of color and that are amplifying the stories that are important to us and vital to us to be able to thrive and for allies who are engaged in the fight to also think about using those outlets as a way to help steer um, equity towards those for different folks to have opportunities. So stay tuned for that. We'll be, we sent out a, um, an email, but it will, we'll get a reminder November 16th from seven to eight. And uh, uh, Nicole, Nicole, yeah, Nicole and uh, what's this other lady, Melanie. Melanie. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you too for, uh, you know, for structuring this and putting it together. Yeah, it's a very small platform right now, but if we reach one person, it's worth it. But it also sets the tone for going forward for the things we want to look to do. So these are footprints, but they're giant footprints and blueprints for us to be able to follow. So thank you. Uh, thank everybody involved. We're doing this. Thank you. Thanks for your time. And uh, we will see you very soon at another KCMPT event. Thanks, everyone. Vote, right. vote, vote. Vote, vote, vote. All right. Good night, everyone.